Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar today on online teaching practices for health educators presented by Osmosis and the Association of College and University Educators. I'm going to give it just a second for everyone to get logged in and then we'll get started. Okay, Elizabeth, next slide if you could. So again, welcome. My name is Katherine Johnson and I'm Senior Director of Institutional Engagement here at Osmosis. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Osmosis, we are a health education platform powered by approachable, professionally illustrated videos and associated assessment items, built with a vision of helping everyone who cares for someone learn by Osmosis. To achieve this vision, our team has the mission of empowering the world's clinicians and caregivers with the best learning experience possible. And every day we work towards this vision and mission by practicing Osmosis's six values, which you see here, uh, starting with the heart, spreading joy, having each other's backs, imagining more, opening our arms and reaching further. We are delighted to be co-hosting today's event uh, with AQ in serving our mission. Our presenters today are from the Association of College and University Educators, also known as AQ. AQ prepares credentials and supports faculty to teach with practices that improve student achievement and close equity gaps. Lori Pendleton is the Executive Director of Curriculum and Assessment at AQ. She has more than 25 years of experience in education as a classroom teacher, a building leader, and professional development specialist. Through her work both here and abroad, Lori's witnessed the impact of effective professional development on the improvement of teaching and learning, and ultimately on teacher satisfaction and student achievement. She believes AQ's focus on the practical application of research-based best practices, along with a rich video library, will support the work of university educators. Julie Candio Siegel serves as the director of video production on AQ's content development team and supported the creation of the online teaching toolkit. Formerly, she served as AQ's director of communications and strategic initiatives and developmental editor for the effective teaching practices course. Julie has taught literature and composition at Ramapo College for the past eight years, including during the transition to remote learning and teaching during the COVID-19 pandemic. And she's currently enrolled at Arizona State University's uh, EDD program in leadership and innovation with a concentration on higher ed change leadership. Welcome, Lori and Julie. We're really honored to have you with us today. I'm going to turn it over to Julie to get us started in just a second. Um, but before we get started, I'd like to share a few participation guidelines. So first, please introduce yourselves using the chat feature in Zoom. And throughout the webinar, we will use chat to engage with you and to share supplemental resources. If you have a question for Lori uh, or Julie, please use the Zoom Q&A feature to ask those questions. And know that we have reserved about half of our time today for your questions. Thank you. So we're going to get started. And um, Elizabeth, you can advance to the next slide. So what we're going to be presenting today is a great starting point for effective online instruction. And we're going to be presenting six different strategies that you can use for online teaching. And these strategies are coming from our online teaching toolkit. Our online teaching toolkit was developed as a response to the pandemic when higher ed, everyone was frantically trying to transition to remote instruction. And they said, well, what can we be doing? What are practical strategies we can be doing within these two weeks that we have to move our courses online? So we said, let's give you six things, right? Six things would be manageable um, as a good starting point. So we're gonna talk about those today. And so this toolkit is effective for instructors 
who teach any type of online course, also hybrid courses, and it has been viewed over 120,000 times to date by educators and other professionals. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome. The three things that I'd like to talk to you about are a welcoming video, question and answer, and social forums, and an orientation video. So the purpose of a welcoming video is just to give students in your course an ins some insight into your personality and who you are. It's just an introduction. And interestingly enough, students report that they really like informal, it videos that really show you as a person. So sh sharing a welcoming video at the very beginning of your course is really a way to let students know, I'm here, I'm a real person, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Um, in the development of the course, we interview a number of students about their experiences. And one thing that a student said about the welcoming videos is, I think we should get to know every instructor and why they love to teach this course. And I thought that little statement, why do you love, why are you passionate about this course, is something that is really easy to add into that welcoming video. And what's interesting about that is, as soon as you do that and you start talking with that passion, then you become animated animated and students can feel that energy. Um, another student had a really interesting insight where she said, if an instructor didn't welcome me to an online course, it would be like they came into the room, walked to the board and just started teaching. And I was like, yeah, that would feel a little strange to be in that classroom. And an online environment is very similar. So hearing from our students, that welcoming video is really important. And it doesn't have to be a high production value. It can just be uh, put your iPhone up in front of you and start talking and welcome your students to the video, uh, to the course. Q&A and social forums, we all need that sort of human connection, even though it's online, we have to work really hard in our on online courses to find ways to build that human connection. That's why we had you do the chat with your name in there. Lots of names, we now have 107 participants, that's a lot of you. Julie and I are not going through and saying, oh, there's Dan. However, just having that name, and I'm sure some of you are probably scanning to see if you have have anybody that you know to make those connections. That's really important, those social forums. We hear from students that they feel very alone and isolated sometimes in online classes, and it's hard to learn when you're feeling that alone. Learning is a social environment, so you really want to make sure to try to build that. And then Q&A forums, you're not always going to be available to answer student questions, so really encouraging them to ask each other through Q&A forums can really help. And the last suggestion we have is um, to create an orientation video that takes students through the structure of your course. This is what the modules will look like. This is what a week will go look like. Here's where you go to get a question and answer forum asked. Here's where you go to ask them um, to send me an email. All those little sort of things that you would want your students to understand about the structure um, and resource resources and supports in the tool in your module can be helpful as an orientation video. So those are three strategies that can be really helpful um, in welcoming students to an online en environment and show that you care and make sure that your students are prepared to really start strong. So we're now going to put you to work a little bit in the chat using the pound welcome and in the chat that allows us to then sort the chat and we can send these out. Um, we all have some of our favorite strategies to welcome students. Um, sometimes they're icebreakers, sometimes they're those questions, those thought provoking questions that get students to, to start talking to each other. Um, what strategies have you found useful to welcome students to an online course? And if you're willing to share your great ideas, just go ahead and pound that in, uh, pound that, <laughs> post that in the chat using the pound sign welcome. Um, we will sort that out 
out. And at the end of the workshop, we'll send those all out to everyone. And I see intro video, self and students. Build, having students create their own videos is another really great idea. Um, speed breakouts to meet each other, excellent ideas. So at the end of the workshop, we'll collect, gather all that, and send this information out to everyone else. And with that, I will send it off to Julie. Thanks, Lori. So one of the ways, uh, one of the things that the introduction does in welcoming students to your course and having them introduce themselves to each other is about building presence. The human connection is so important to kind of break through that barrier that the screen might provide for some people. So there are three types of connections that we typically have in an online course. The first is from the student to the content itself. What are you having them read? What videos are they watching? The second is student to student. We hear from faculty and we hear from students that students are more likely to have a great experience in an online course if they know at least one other person in the course. So we should think strategically about how we can build connections between students, not only to the material. The third type of connection is from student to instructor. So how does the student connect with you? And that's what we're talking about really when we're talking about your online presence. So a couple different strategies that you can use to establish your presence in an online course. First is scheduling when you're going to log in. We might have this tendency sometime because we're all very busy people to say, oh, I can log in anytime. I'm going to get to that later. But if we schedule time to log into the course, that is the best practice to ensure that we have set aside that time to read the discussion forums, to engage with students, answer questions, check out that Q&A forum. Um, so it ensures that it actually happens. The second thing is, is being available during high traffic times. As many of you probably know, your LMS is data rich. So you can go in there and actually see when students are logging on and make sure that you're available at those high traffic times and also before major assignments are due. Because we know sometimes students may have this tendency to procrastinate, and so we really want to be available um, the times the day before an assignment is due in case they have those last minute questions. The third thing is communicating when you're available and what your response time typically is. So saying to students in your syllabus and reinforcing throughout the semester, I will respond to you within 24 hours where I will always respond to student emails after 5 p.m. because I'm working during the day. Um, a lot of professors tell us they feel this tendency to be online at all times because they're teaching online. You don't have to be online at all times and students reaffirm this for us, but we should let them know when we will be available online. The fourth thing is posting weekly announcements. And I know Lori's gonna talk about this a little bit more later, um, but just having a weekly announcement, it's the start of the week, this is what we're gonna be talking about. These are our learning objectives. This is what we're here to tackle. Shows that you're there and you're engaged with the students. Next is hosting virtual office hours. So these can be one-on-one. -on -one. You can have a set time that's just drop-in for students as students need um, or request office hours, or you can hold group office hours, which students have said is very helpful. Students have also said that they really appreciate when instructors vary the times of office hours because they all work different times. They have different schedules. So this is really important to creating an inclusive learning environment, learning environment online for all students. Next is being present in the discussion forums. So one of the experts in our online course, Flower Darby, says that, you know, if you post in the discussion forums your question and then never return to it, it's like being in a classroom, asking a question, and then turning around and walking out of the room. So we do not wanna do that online and we can ensure that we don't do that by making sure that we're engaged with the students as they're responding to discussion forum posts. The last thing is providing meaningful feedback. So feedback is something that students said is one way professors communicate that they care about them. I put up a picture of a student, Faith, who we interviewed from the Community College of Rhode Island, who says that having positive feedback from her instructor made the world of difference. It was essentially the difference of staying in a course or giving up and dropping out of the course. Getting that meaningful feedback was really, really impactful. So these are just some um, opportunities 
to make sure that students see that you are visible in an online course. So the next topic that we're going to talk about is organizing your online course and a couple of things to keep in mind. One is to be learner centered, um, which really means to look at your course from a student view. Uh, in fact, most learning management systems have that ability for you to turn on the student view. And sometimes it's a real eye opener for, for what it looks like from a student's viewpoint. Um, is it easy to see where you go next? Is it easy to see where you try to, where you need to get, go to get help? Um, is it linear and does it make sense? First I do this and now I click here to do this. Uh, so that having that um, student mindset or learner centered mindset can really help be the first step to making sure that your online course doesn't end up becoming a barrier to student participation. Um, it's really, you know, again, a lot of online students are working at off hours. So if they are on there in week one and can't find the first um, discussion post or not sure what to say or where to go, that immediately can send up a roadblock to them and they may decide at that point they're going to drop out and not continue. If you sort of compare that to a face-to-face -face course, you see right away when a student's getting frustrated and you can step in, but you're not there watching over their shoulder in the online environment. So you do want to make sure that your the organization of your online course is clear and consistent. So this idea of a beginner's mindset is really helpful. Um, in fact, a lot of our, our experts recommended getting a colleague. You know, once you've finished your course and you're ready to launch it, put a, a colleague in as a student and ask them to go through and ask them if the structure is clear, if you know if it's clear from, um, of the way you're supposed to go. And then avoiding assumptions and jargon, um, especially with the move to remote online learning. Many of our students are brand new to it. Um, so things that we might assume students know, like post your response to the discussion forum, they might not even know that language. What is a discussion forum? What's a response? Um, how do I reply to a student? So avoiding those assumptions and jargon can really make a difference. And using videos can really make a difference. Um, and again, if you equate that to being face-to-face, -face, you most likely would put up a video or put up the show, uh, project your computer and show students where to go. You want to try to do that in the online environment as well. A lot of the students also commented that they really appreciate consistency in the module design. So when I, one student said, I know I go in Sunday night, all the due dates for the week are laid out, all the discussion forums are laid out, I know what I need to do, each of the readings are listed under the resources for this week, I don't have to um, sort of sort through all the resources that are available for the whole course. I know these are the ones that I need for this week um, so that I can go in and get re direct links to those resources. Um, and also, one of our faculty members said that one of her um, biggest ahas about teaching online was this understanding that just because I can put it in as a resource doesn't necessarily mean I should. Um, and that is, you know, resource overload for students. Um, there are some students who are very eager and they will try to read and access and look at everything. So really in your, um, the organization of your course, making it clear, these are must use resources. And these are resources if you wanna go a little bit deeper or you wanna learn a little bit more. So what are those making it clear about what's required? And then what are those additional resources? And then the consistent module overview. A lot of um, faculty use the structure, what are we going to do? Why are we doing it? And then how should you do it? Um, so using that structure can be helpful. And then the idea about being very predictable, um, what's due, what's new, what's coming up, making sure that students know if they have a long-term project that you bring that back up. Don't forget in week 10, you have this long-term project. You're not gonna be able to have it finish it in a couple of days. You might wanna get started on it right now. 
So um, that those announcements that Julie mentioned on Monday, what's due this week, what's new, what's coming up, what can you look forward to? And then Wednesday, some midweek motivation. Uh, what, what are we having? What's coming up? Um, you're all doing a great job. I've looked at the initial discussion posts. They're looking great. I'm really proud of the learning you're doing. Sort of motivation to keep students going. And then Friday, the weekend update. Here's what we, uh, here's what's coming up. Here's what to do. Make sure that you've used this resource and you've, um, you are able to get that assignment in. So we have a lot of assignments that are end up, that we end up having due on um, the weekend, you know, the end of the week, Saturday or Sunday. So sort of keeping the, that in mind and helping students build their rhythm. So one of our goals here is to practice what we preach and show you some of the different ways that you can engage students when you're doing a live session. Um, and so we're going to launch a poll and it's true or false based on your own experience. Do you find it challenging holding discussions in your courses? True or false? I'll give you a minute to respond here. All right, well, hopefully we got some responses there and can close the poll and take a look at that. Um, so more than half said that they find it um, challenging to hold discussions in your online courses. And that's not surprising at all. I think that's a challenge for everyone. Um, and it's something we heard a lot, especially from non-humanities faculty saying, well, what are they going to talk about? When my discipline is so black and white, what can I have students actually discussing? So let's dive into some of these strategies that you can use to get there. So for planning and facilitating discussions, the first thing I want to do is I want to see you post in the chat whether you teach asynchronously, synchronously, or hybrid. Um, I want to get a sense of how many people are teaching uh, asynchronously and synchronously. And I actually saw a question come in about that as well. Hi, Flex. Yep. Great. So while you're doing that, let's talk about planning for uh, different ways that you can plan for your discussions. So one thing you want to think very intentionally about is your prompts. Um, a couple of things to think about for this. Consider what your goals are. So in some instances, you may say, I want to build community among peers. And maybe you'll have um, some of your students tap into their personal experiences, talk about real world instances that they've experienced, about their professional experience, about their academic experiences. But you just want to be able to think about what your goals are and how they're connected to your objectives. That's first of all. Second, leveraging students' experiences. So just like we're asking you to contribute to the chat what your experiences are, knowing that you hold a wealth of knowledge, your students probably also hold a wealth of knowledge and they can contribute to the conversation. So how can you devise prompts that ask about students' experiences? The third is real world application, and I'll talk about this more in a minute. But what is happening in the news? What current events relate? to your course content so you can make it relevant for students. And then the last thing is we know that choice is motivating for any of us. When we have a choice in something, we're more inclined to be excited about it. So giving students multiple prompts and allowing them to choose which one they respond to is motivating. The other thing we want to do is make sure that we set very clear expectations. A lot of the times when discussions fall flat, it's because students didn't know what was expected of them. So certain things we can do, first of all, is provide a rationale about why we're engaging in the discussion and what we hope students are going to gain from it. Um, the second thing is, is making sure that we share very detailed explanations, um, rubrics, and exemplars. So making sure that we have very clear upfront what we expect from students, how they're going to be assessed, and sharing what an exemplar post looks like. So some of the instructors that we've interviewed say that in the early stages of the semester, they go in and respond in the discussion forum 
as if they are a student with very accessible language, not dumbing down the material, but just responding as they would in a peer-to-peer -peer interaction and letting students know, hey, this is what I'm expecting in a post from you as well, and you can do this. The last thing is obviously just what I said, modeling quality posts early in the term. So whether you model the posts or you pull out examples of quality posts from students and share those in an announcement, either way is a good way to clarify what your expectations are. On the other side, when you're actually facilitating the discussions, Elizabeth, you can click, thank you. Um, we wanna make sure that we're engaging students in really quality discussions. And one thing we wanna do is balance voices. So sometimes we may have an overactive or eager student who's dominating a discussion in a live session. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're acknowledging the great job that um, the more dominant students are doing because they're so engaged and wanna share. But we also wanna bring out the voices of the quieter students to the students who are more hesitant to post. And this could be through announcements, it could be through individual outreach, but we wanna make sure that we are kind of having an even playing field in terms of students being able to respond. And so we should set an expectation of how many posts we'd like for students to, to share or to contribute in a forum. So it may be post an original response and then post two responses to peers posts. The other thing we wanna do is build peer-to-peer -peer connection. So in an asynchronous format, if we have a really large class, we might wanna break students down into smaller groups, which most LMSs allow for. And in the same way, in a synchronous session like this, we may wanna use breakout rooms to ensure that all students have an opportunity to contribute. It may be very overwhelming for a student to post or speak out when there are 400 attendees or 100 attendees. So how can we get them talking in groups of three to four? Um, we also want to make sure, again, that we give very specific guidelines for response posts. So that could be assigning roles to students. Hey, play the devil's advocate in this response post. Or um, make sure that you find an additional source to support what your peer is saying. Things like that. The last thing we want to do is summarize and clarify. I'm sure many of us have had this experience. We were required to post twice. We did it, we are out of that forum, and we never return back to look at it. But as instructors, we need to make sure that we summarize what happened in the forum so students know that what the takeaway should be. And we could do this in the form of an announcement, or we can assign that to a student. Each week, a different student has to summarize the discussion forum and share that announcement with the class, and you can require students to read that as well. Specifically in synchronous classes, one thing we can do is leverage asynchronous activities. So some of the instructors that we have worked with have done a great job of having an asynchronous discussion and then pulling out ideas from that to lead the synchronous discussion. You can have student-led discussions. You can have students present what they had initially shared and thought through during the asynchronous forum. Again, you can use breakout rooms for smaller groups. And something else you can do is ask students to evaluate their own participation, which is a great practice um, for students to reflect on how well they contributed and even assign themselves points for their participation. Um, so one slide ahead here, Elizabeth. Um, I didn't want you to just hear it from me. So I pulled some of our friends who we have interviewed and this is, um, these are some of our expert faculty as well as course designers because it's enough for me to just say, oh, you can have a discussion in any type of discipline. But these are ways specifically that you can engage students in a discussion in a discussion in non-humanities courses. So Dana says, ask questions about ethics. What would you do in this scenario and how could your response help to improve your professional practice? Whitney from UNC would say, use cases or spotlights. So she pulls from national news stories or local news stories. One example she gave us, you see the goat at the bottom, is uh, goats in Knoxville eating grass. And she had her students discuss it as a budgeting policy because she teaches government. Um, and then finally from Jennifer, who is one of our math instructors, she says, focus on soft skills and metacognition. Um, so help students think about how they learn best. And she asks a lot of questions that are 
geared toward a growth, developing a growth mindset in students and pr productive struggle. Um, she has them compare different math strategies. And another thing she does is she uses a three, two, one format. So she asks students, tell me three things you learned, two examples of how to apply this, and one thing that you're still struggling with. And by engaging students in these types of discussions, it's not only helpful for the student to reflect, but it's helpful for you as the instructor to gather all of that data so you can act on it and understand what students are struggling with it and provide additional resources and so on. Um, so just some ways that you can do it in your, your own courses. Explain three, two, one again before we move on. So you can do this with any type of discussion and have students give three things, two things, and one thing. Um, but for Jennifer's class, what she does is ask students to say three things you learned in this unit, two, th two examples of how you would apply this concept, and one thing you're still struggling with it. So there are different ways and different things you can assign to these three, two, one, but that is one example of how to do it. Hey, thanks, Julie. <clears throat> Another example of a resource that can be particularly helpful in online classes are micro lectures. And the definition of a micro lecture is a short video lecture that takes between six to 10 minutes. So rather than putting an entire recorded lecture online, we record these smaller, shorter chunks. And one thing to think about is, you know, what we say in our face-to-face -face courses, my students seem to handle a 45-minute lecture fine, and, you know, I don't need to chunk it. But really, when you think about your behavior in that 45 minutes, you really are chunking it. You're stopping, you're asking questions, you're moving your position, you're walking up and down the aisles. So you are giving those breaks to students, and that's what we're talking about in the micro lecture is breaking those longer lectures up into shorter, more concise topics uh, and micro lectures between six to 10 minutes because that is about the attention span that we can have. So to create an effective micro lecture, the one first thing you want to do is to really identify the core concept. What is the concept for this particular micro lecture? What kind of byproduct for that that we've heard from um, the students that we've interviewed is not only does that help you structure that micro lecture, it also gives students a library where they can go back and access that micro lecture. So for example, if you're talking about how do you create dummy variables in SPSS and it's a short six minute video when the student then needs to do that that, they can go back, oh yeah, that was in module three, they can go back and access just that short video. So they'll be more likely to re-watch that particular video. So identify that core concept. It really also helps to create a script um, that you can follow. You certainly don't need to then read the script, but to have that script available so that you don't forget or you don't end up meandering in your conversation. And then think about a hook or an engagement trigger, you know, a, a cartoon or a funny um, saying or a quote or um, just something that will bring the students in and get them interested in watching that video. Um, to deliver, you want to make sure that you're concise. In order to get the six to 10 minutes, you really do have to think about what is it that you're going to say? What is most important for, for me to get across to these students that they may not be able to get in their reading or that will help me clarify from the reading? What is it that they need to hear from me and how can I be concise about that? Um, add energy to it. So again, you know, oh, I'm excited to give this lecture and you bring that energy to you. Um, one piece of advice that we have from our film crew, they always tell our faculty to smile while you're talking because that automatically gives you energy. Uh, so that is uh, one little hint that sometimes can help. And be human. Um, you know, I have done these micro lectures where I've stopped and re recorded because I missed something or I said something wrong. It's okay. You know, it's okay to say, whoops, let me say that one more time. Students appreciate that. That humanness is really important. And believe me, it saves you. It's, it's no fun to have to re record because you made a mistake two minutes in. Um, just go with it and <laughs> keep going. And then think too about the audio only students. So either because of um, lack of broadband issues that they can't actually watch a micro lecture, the video, it takes up too much bandwidth 
with. Um, but making sure that you're thinking about those audio only students as well, um, keeping that in mind. Um, and then really engaging students in that video, talking about pre and post lecture activities. So in the discussion forum you, you started last week or in the pre uh, reading that you had earlier this week, we talked about this topic. Um, so bring that back into the video. Talking about student work can be really helpful as can uh, referencing real world scenarios. Um, wow, I can't believe what you just heard in the news. You know, did you hear that? That has um, applicability to what we're talking about right now, um, but because that does keep your videos relevant uh, and keep students interested in that topic as well. Um, the whole idea of micro lectures, Elizabeth, you can move the slide forward. Um, I, uh, as you know, Catherine mentioned, um, I'm the executive director of assessment as well. And in our course, we do ask our, our course takers to write reflections. And I was going through and I read this one um, from a professor that I thought was really interesting um, because she said, you know, when, when we made the move to remote learning, I had all my lectures recorded. So I just posted them on the website. I was like, you know, okay, this is perfect. They're in the course shell. Um, they're available for students to watch. It'll be just like they're in class. And then in the final eval, one of the questions she asked was, how many of the lectures did you watch? And she was really disappointed to see that only 25% of her students had even watched the videos. So she took that longer, those longer lectures and just broke them up. So she didn't re-record them. She just broke them up, added, a, added an engagement trigger and a closing and put those up and added some questions. And she can see now from the, um, metrics in the, the learning management system that our students are actually now watching them because of that short, concise, a student can sit down on their commute on the train ride, they can put their headphones in and instead of watching a TikTok, they can watch your micro lecture. So um, they'll be learning at that time. So micro lectures are really helpful. Um, you can click through this, Elizabeth, and um, I'll explain each when the rest of the text comes up. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that we very frequently hear is, okay, I can post a lecture, or I can assign a reading, but how do I guarantee that students are actually going to watch or do the reading? And one of the biggest things is ensuring some level of accountability in addition to the engagement piece. So these are some different ways that you can ensure accountability. Um, for what you assign to students. The first thing is having students submit discussion questions. So we talked a little bit about a little bit before about you writing your own prompts, but what about students writing the prompts, which means they have to have read, thought deeply about the material um, in order to generate a meaningful prompt. The second thing is having students annotate and snap a picture. We have an instructor who has students either um, electronically or just you know, old school, handwriting their notes, um, annotate readings and then snap a picture and she awards them credit for the picture. Another thing you can do is require students to respond to a discussion prompt, which we talked a little bit about before, or use open notes quizzes. A lot of the students uh, who we talked to about open notes quizzes said they were more likely to reread, rewatch videos, take very good notes when they knew that they were going to be able to use them for a quiz. On the right hand side here, you see I sort of built this staircase of engagement and this is coming from one of the professors we interviewed. Her name's Gina from IUPUI and she's a forensic science professor. And these are four different ways that she has engaged her students in her course materials. And at the lowest level, we have reusing existing materials. Here is a bullet a video and it allows students to actually rotate the bullet and look at it. So if you have existing materials out there, no need to recreate them. Um, use those videos to engage students. Something that's interactive is great. At the second level, we have um, an actual recreation of a lab. So she went into labs and created Google videos, taking students on Google tours through the labs because, and they can actually click on each piece, see what the part of the lab is, what it does, how it functions. At the third level, she actually does labs in front of students and films herself doing the labs. One of the things she says is she pays special attention 
to what the smells are and how she describes the smells, the touch, very, very descriptive in her videos and then has students respond to questions in that way. At the highest level, she actually sends lab kits to students so they can conduct the labs in their own home. Um, so the students we talked to talked about how exciting it was to dust for fingerprints in these labs at home with their kids. They tried to do the labs multiple times so they could show their friends. Um, so not saying everyone we have to get up to that level right from the get-go, but these are just four different ways that we can think about how to engage students in the material, even in an online course. And then the other thing we can do is make sure that we help keep students organized. So providing very clear directions is important. Um, many of you have probably heard about the transparent assignment template, the TILT project, um, making sure that we are clear about what the purpose is of the assignment or the reading or video. Um, what the steps are for students to complete it, and then how students are going to be evaluated on whatever the supplemental pieces are. Sharing a skeletal outline, so having a document for students to actually write on or take notes on as they engage with video or text materials. And then the third thing is providing guiding questions, so actually sharing a couple questions with students about what their takeaways should be from the reading so that they can actively watch instead of passively sitting there while they're engaging in the materials. So we wanted to ask you one more time, put you to work. A lot of the times I think we attend these webinars or we listen to things and we get very excited. Oh, I just learned all of this new stuff. But we wanna actually um, have you think about what you're gonna do with all of this information. So we're asking you to post in the chat with the hashtag next steps what are you going to do when you leave this webinar? What area of your course out of these six areas are you going to take another look at? Or what might you do differently as a result of the information we just shared? While they're doing that, Elizabeth, you can flip to the next slide. That's the one. Um, so I just wanted to share some additional information. Um, as I shared earlier, the, all of these strategies came from our online teaching toolkit. So I put the link there in case you want to revisit the toolkit. We shared a little bit more on this, but there are some great videos on there um, from others um, like Mike Wesh from Kansas State, Flower Darby, um, if you want to take another look at that. The second thing is, is we recently released an inclusive teaching practices toolkit. So this is another free resource available to you and the link is there. The third thing I wanted to mention is that we are not typically a toolkit organization. Our um, role in higher ed is to provide robust faculty development. Um, we partner with institutions. We also partner with individual faculty. So we have open enrollment courses. And the next one is launching August 22nd. So if you are interested in exploring that more, the link for that is um, posted as well. Thank you so much, Julie and Lori. So uh, now is the time as promised for uh, us to answer your questions. And uh, there are a few. Um, so the first one is from uh, Katie Weiss. She asked about uh, for micro lectures, do you recommend posting these separately as individual videos uh, or pausing in longer videos? That's a great question. And it's really best to post them as the shorter videos for a couple of reasons. One is um, students oftentimes when you pause a video and they go back in, they end up having to start from the beginning. And you also want to think again about students with broadband issues um, that downloading a particularly long video can can take up a lot of bandwidth. Shorter videos are quicker and easier to access and download and to find your way. Again, you know, if you want to use it, um, if they want to use them as an additional resource afterwards, being able to go back directly to that point can be really um, much easier in a shorter video. I think the other really important thing too is that even in shorter videos that are five to seven minutes, Integrating pause points is also an evidence-based practice. So it's not to say that if you have a four to six minute video that you're not still pausing and having the students do something or reflect on a question. We have a lot of faculty who will go two minutes, talk about a problem, and then 
pass over the baton to students and say, hey, try this out, pause the video, and then come back and I'm going to work through the solution. Connected to that, um, when we talk about a micro lecture, are we talking about asynchronous in all those times or is there a way to do this with synchronous lectures on Zoom? I think it can, it's mostly used truthfully in the asynchronous environment, but you absolutely can use it as well in the synchronous environment. Um, we have some folks who have a developed course that is produced by someone else. So we might have, um, you saw the picture of Whitney, for example, she has developed a course. She has videos that she's produced and then someone else um, is a different professor is presenting those in synchronous sessions. So that professor might show the shorter video. Um, so it really, you know, and I could also imagine um, Gina, the forensic scientist, creating a micro lecture of that, um, of her doing a one of those experiments and then showing that video in a synchronous session. Um, it's typically used in async, but it could be used in either. And I think one of the key things too is we talked about leveraging asynchronous opportunities during the synchronous session. So what are the advantages of posting that video beforehand um, in terms of what you can then do on a Zoom and as far as engaging students in a conversation or having them think at a higher level for application? If they have the foundation in an asynchronous format, there are many more opportunities for when you um, to capitalize on the live time that you have together. Thank you. Yes. So nodding to the flipped classroom there, which is increasing in popularity in uh, medicine uh, and health related professions. Um, so um, Eric Stano had a uh, question or wanted to hear thoughts about uh, gathering and utilizing data when conducting classes online. Um, and you talked a little bit about this in terms of knowing what our LMS does and when peak periods are, but could you speak a little bit more towards uh, keeping students engaged? Sure, I'll take that, Julie. One of the, um, you know, really understanding and leveraging the power of the LMS um, depends a bit on your LMS and what you, how easy it is to get that data. But think, looking at things like how often students are engaged in the course, um, being able to send a video, uh, send a message that says, I noticed you haven't logged on for three or four days. Um, all, you know, sometimes that really sort of shocks the student into, whoa, you can watch me. Okay. Okay, I, I guess I better log in. Um, and on the flip side, you know, you might have a student who seems to be spending an inordinate amount of time in the course, you know, and checking in with them. Um, do they need some support with reading or do they, you know, so looking at it from both ends, you're not engaging or they might be spending a lot of time in the course. Um, leveraging to you know go into the grade book and finding out does uh we had one professor which i thought was brilliant you know three hours before an assignment was due she'd go into the grade book and say message anyone who hasn't passed it in yet and say you know i noticed you haven't passed your assignment in yet i hope you've started it's going to take you at least two hours to work on it you know so just a little prod and a little hint so really understanding what are all the tools that you can leverage in your lms <clears throat> Thank you. Um, what is your recommendation for high flex curricula, which is a new term to me, so if we could identify that, uh, where students are in class as well as on Zoom and especially with respect to small group activities? I think one of the things that I would do, and Julie um, mentioned this as well, is to think, sort of lay out all the different activities and assignments and things that you do, and then what medium is best for which. So if you have students in front of you in a Zoom, um, it's probably not a good idea to have them go and read something for 10 minutes. You know, that's something they can do offline. So really sort of um, laying out all those different assignments and tasks and things that you like to do in that course. And then sort of, I would even put them on index cards. This one's gonna be in a Zoom session. This one's gonna be async. This is gonna be in small group work that I'm gonna ask the students to do offline, not in a Zoom session, but meet together offline at a time that works for them. Um, these are things that are gonna be completely async. These are gonna be things that are completely offline um, and sort of structure it that way. 
And Julie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say, um, you saw Whitney's picture before, along with the icon of the goat. Um, she said that she used to be known as Post-it Girl at her <laughs> campus because she put down everything on Post-it. So I think if we are, and I know a lot of people are going to be in the position where instructors are teaching in live classes and students have the option to either go or be online. I think we have to be really intentional about thinking through the three levels of connection that I talked about earlier, which is how do students engage with the content, engage with each other, and engage with you as the instructor. So one of the most important things is thinking about for the students who come face to face how they engage with their peers in the face-to-face -face setting in a way that is safe at this point in time. And in the same way, if students are also online and have the opportunity to be online, how can you still have them form connections with other students, even as they would in a face-to-face -face class? So I think it's sort of stripping down your curriculum and thinking about how to achieve students interacting with the content, with each other, and with you in a way that is meaningful, regardless of the medium that they choose. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, if you have other questions, the Q&A button at the very bottom next to your mute uh, is a great way to submit your questions. I, I do want to ask one that, um, uh, that came up earlier. So, uh, from your work with educators around the country, did you find that they had success promoting student engagement in an online learning environment when classes first transitioned to online learning due to COVID? And uh, secondary to that, how, how can health professions educators listening in today really promote student engagement to the, ensure those students uh, are optimally learning? I can take that one, especially because I was one of the instructors switching to remote instruction. At, I work for Ramapo College. And um, one of the things that I did initially was while we were still in the classroom and hearing that it might we might be going online, I pulled students and I said, what are you most concerned about with the shift to online? And what students said were they were concerned about the quality of the courses being diminished by moving online. They were worried about a lack of engagement and they were worried that they would get lower grades or be scored <laughs> um, lower for not participating in a synchronous session when they obviously have other things going on. I had students whose family members passed away, students who were sick themselves. And so the first thing is communicating that you care about the students and you care about their success. That is the one thing we heard time and again from students that when they moved to online, the biggest difference that was made was in the professors who communicated that they cared about them and that they were willing to be flexible with them. In terms of engagement, I opted to just go and do synchronous sessions with my students that were optional and I kept to the same class time. So I organized my class so they had a half hour before for asynchronous activities. Then we got on Zoom for an hour and then right after that they had some group work to do with uh, in small groups with their other classmates. And that was my approach to remote instruction because I didn't want them to have to deal with all the other noise and scheduling other time when they had five other courses to attend to. In terms of engagement, I think the biggest thing is making sure, again, that students can engage with each other and engage with the material in a meaningful way. So it's exactly what Lori and I have been talking about, how to have really meaningful conversations. If you can have live sessions, how to utilize the asynchronous materials and make sure that students are engaging with each other and thinking at higher levels. Um, and then also making sure that the materials are accessible to students and that we, you know, maybe don't have an 80 minute or 90 minute lecture just posted online without opportunities for them to interact and reflect. So I think exactly what we've been talking about today are some of the strategies that are helpful for engagement, especially um, during the current time and being flexible with students and showing that we care. Thank you. Um, a, a bit of a challenging question, uh, potentially next, and I'm happy to jump in a little bit here too, but uh, Eric Stano is asking if we can speak to what we perceive to be the greatest challenges for online courses in health professions and what our advice might be, um, given that health professions uh, may, be a, may be a bit 
a bit harder. And uh, as a launching off point, I will say that in my conversations with many faculty at, um, at um, medical and nursing programs, I'm hearing that the biggest challenge has not been the preclinical work, but it is the teaching the clinical skills um, where we where we need more hands uh, hands on or small group learning and uh, and often it seems that that's been deferred or moved to simulation based activities which uh, which seem which seem to go some way in closing closing that gap. I wonder, Julie and Lori, if you've heard anything. I think that is in. The, the one of the biggest challenges that our course takers are folks who are currently in taking the course and are in the medical field um, and even you know folks that are preparing teachers you know they have to do clinical experiences as well and how do you do that you know do you have them watch a class on a, on zoom um so ever it, it's it's a challenge that a lot of folks are are hitting um and reaching and it's there's been some real creative um you know we're going to to uh, do some simulations via Zoom, but it's really, you know, it comes down to really clearly understanding what your goals and objectives are and what's the best way to meet that. So if your goal and objective is that they are able to learn how to do something um, physical that they actually have to, you know, I was talking to someone who is um, in massage, teaches massage therapy, and she's like, you know, I, they have to, they have to do it, you know, and I have to watch them do it. Um, so she said, up zoom you know private zoom meetings with them where and then as soon as she was able to get into a clinical setting with them she did it so it was deferred a bit it is it is definitely a challenge yeah i was gonna say we were hearing a lot of the same things with hands-on learning which is one of the reasons why i shared the photos of what gina was doing with her students to say you know I don't think we can say we're going to transform our entire curriculum within two weeks, but there are things we can be doing with existing materials and then build our own materials in the future in order to kind of fill those gaps. But I had also heard a lot about hands on learning being one of the biggest challenges and I, I think I invite any of the participants to say what are some of the challenges you've been experiencing in addition to that. Great. Um, yeah, please feel free to, to uh, drop into the chat if anyone has had experience doing this and we can all learn from, from one another. Um, I do want to underscore your, your point about, uh, Lori and Julie, about making sure we understand what it is that we want to assess and letting that guide. Um, there have been a lot of creative approaches and uh, I, I look forward to, to, seeing, to seeing more. Um, we have three minutes left, so perhaps time for um, uh, one more question, if there is one. Uh, Elizabeth Homer, I love this, videos with people practicing on pets and partners. Excellent. Yeah, we found that pets make a big difference. We have a lot of pets in our new course, but we've also heard a lot of faculty saying just showing my pet and my welcome video makes a difference. <laughs> Wonderful. These are great suggestions. So telehealth interviews, I've seen some really interesting telehealth curriculums. I think Hofstra has an open access one, um, right, doing uh, uh, doing physical assessments on uh, on children and spouses. Uh, uh, Hofstra, uh, I think it's the Zucker School of Medicine, has the has the program. So um, yeah, so with with two minutes left, I want to remind everyone that we will be sharing a recording of today's webinar um, with everyone who registered. So you can watch it again. It won't be a micro lecture, but hopefully you know where the good parts are. And uh, thank you so very much for joining. We hope that this was uh, a good use of your time. And do we have a poll questions queued up for the end? I don't think that we do, but um, uh, if, you, uh, if you enjoyed it, please let us know and uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.